destitute beginnings in Jamaica. Created one of the most feared drug gangs in American history. He is responsible for thousands of deaths. His impact is felt even today, a continuing war against drugs. Buster Coke created an empire. An empire built on fear. of organized crime, violence is not uncommon. Brutality is often a tradition with origins that can be traced back centuries. In the 1980s, however, a new crime organization took hold. Born of the drug trade and unrestrained by ancient custom, the Shower Posse brought havoc not only to its native Jamaica, but across the United States as well. At the top of the organization stood the most feared posse down of them all, Lester Lloyd Coke. In less than a decade, Lester Coke's shower posse rose from obscurity in the political unrest of Jamaica to prominence as one of the most feared drug gangs in American history. And in that same decade, the FBI, the DEA, and the ATF fought together in an unprecedented battle to bring down Lester Coke, and in doing so, raised the stakes in a widening war against drugs. To most, Jamaica is a vacation paradise, the birthplace of reggae music, a land of unique art and culture. The qualities that bring millions of tourists to the island make it an enchanting destination. But there's another Jamaica, a complicated land with a tragic past. This was a Jamaica that created Lester Lloyd Coke. Coke grew up in Tivoli Gardens, a poor community on the outskirts of the Jamaican capital of Kingston. His early life was spent in this cramped tenement yard. As many as 10 families lived here, each limited to a single room, with the entire building sharing one bathroom. He came from the world of the sufferers, those sharing a life of extreme poverty and desperation. Well, the typical childhood of a sufferer youth in Jamaica is a very frightening one, in the sense that many of, the, many of that generation was simply not able to have access to high schools. I mean, their schooling would end at the age of 14 or 15. It would mean then that just housing would be a serious problem. Um, getting food on a daily basis would be a serious problem. Many of these people de um, depended on remittances coming from abroad. I mean, that, that really sometimes determined whether they survived or did not survive. And of course, growing up in those communities with the level of violence, you really had to be tough in order to survive, and just very difficult to survive if you didn't develop a certain inner toughness. While researching for her book on Jamaican posses, author Laurie Gunst became intimately familiar with the people and the spirit of Jamaica. I came to realize that the main sound that I remembered from Kingston's ghettos was the sound of children crying. It is really weeping and wailing and crying that I remember most of all from those streets, that and the hot sun beating down and the hunger. It's a destitution that is almost impossible for an American to understand because in this country we always have hope. It's a huge country. There's always another frontier. There's always a place to go. In Jamaica there's nowhere to go unless you can escape from the rock, unless you're one of the tiny lucky few who have a visa and can get to the United States. Otherwise, for you, there will be no hope. Like so many of his generation, young Lester Koch found hope in American movies, captivated by the interracial embrace between actors Jim Brown and Raquel Welch in the 1969 movie 100 Rifles. Koch would adopt the film star's name. In Tivoli Gardens, he was the new Jim Brown. I don't know him as Jim Brown. I know him as Babai. Because that's the name we called him when he was a little boy going to school. The boy that Taylor Egbert Edwards knew as Bye Bye offered no hint of his future path. Never seen you fight a boy. 
I never see him in his own note in at all. I know him as a clean man. I used to make his pants when he was a little boy, going to school. So uh, we was associate when he was a small boy, quite nice youth, uh, grew with us, and milk clean. Brown began to learn a trade. He was a welder, a cabinet maker, and a locksmith. His neighbors saw him as a good, hard-working young man, a man looking for an opportunity. But in time, his ambition would lead him to a criminal career, achieving for him the dream of many of the poor in Jamaica, the freedom to escape. The Jamaican people have had a very difficult history. It's a history that is rooted in slavery and in colonialism. But the Jamaican people are also very imaginative, very creative, very aggressive, and very willing to resist oppression. One of the unique features about slavery in Jamaica is that almost every five years there was a major rebellion. And I think that there is something in the Jamaican spirit that makes us willing to resist oppression. You know, that might manifest itself in different forms. What you have in Jamaica is a third world democracy struggling to accommodate itself to a very harsh reality, which is extreme poverty of the majority and the very great wealth of the very, very few. That's not a situation in which democracy thrives. In 1962, the world was on the brink of a third world war when Soviet missiles were placed on Cuban territory. In a tense showdown, the United States demanded their immediate removal. Finally, the Soviet Union acquiesced. From then on, the United States considered the entire Caribbean an important frontier in the East-West struggle. So what happened was that Jamaica began to be drawn into the orbit of this struggle, and her politics polarized accordingly. So that by the time Michael Manley became prime minister in 1972, and articulated socialism as the path his People's National Party was going to follow, and Edward Siaga emerged as the leader of the Jamaica Labor Party, and he was a significant force on the right side, um, that is the right wing side. Politics in Jamaica polarized very sharply along these two lines, and that meant that as far as the ghettos were concerned, there was going to be increasing polarization between the two parties and increasing violence as both sides enlisted their paladins, their gunfighters, to control vast areas of Kingston's ghetto downtown. Basil Wilson, provost of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, has written extensively on the political history of his native Jamaica. And one of the things that emerged is a battle for scarce resources. So the, the party in power tended to build low-income housing and distributed that housing to their supporters. And politicians vying for power would politicize particular communities, be able to provide those communities with contracts, with low-income housing, with other um, niceties of government. And I think that led to highly politicized communities where elections then became a life and death struggle. And the level of this warfare is almost impossible for an American to understand because it involves strategies and tactics such as burning people out of their homes. If there's an area that's known to be packed with supporters of one party and you're in the other party and you want to unseat them, you simply torch that, that neighborhood by night and shoot at the firemen as they're trying to put out the blaze. And when the blaze is over, you bulldoze the rubble and build a housing scheme, as it's called in Jamaica, a housing project, and you pack it full of your own supporters. Because the construction trades in Jamaica were so corrupt and were so tied into the politicians, and because the tribal warfare downtown often consisted of burning out entire neighborhoods in downtown Kingston, the contractor had a had its particularly lucrative tie to the two political parties because when you were a contractor and an area was burnt out and needed to be rebuilt, if you had ties to a politician, you would be the one he would call. So Jim Brown had come up fairly well uh, in West Kingston by the mid-1970s. He was, he was a well-known figure. 
in Tivoli Gardens, which is Siaga's constituency in West Kingston. He was actually a contractor, and he was, he was very much an up-and-coming enforcer. He wanted to get involved as Siaga's right-hand man, and he was pushing himself up through the ranks of West Kingston gunmen. Politics is, is the key thing, factor. This is because we stand up for one thing. You had forces that tried to fight that and f give you a hard fight to. And we had to make sure we keep those forces out. Devin Clark was born on Milk Lane, the same street where Jim Brown spent his early years. You definitely have to have, to, have, to have somebody to make the place where it is. Where you can sleep with the door open, you can do anything at all like that. And that was the kind of man he was. What was happening on the streets downtown? in Kingston was a growing fascination with the Hollywood silver screen and primarily the outlaws and cowboys and bandits that came out of Hollywood in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. All of these movies really captured the Jamaican imagination and the gangsters who were by then up and coming in the ranks of both parties began to style themselves after these cowboy heroes and that became the real kind of emotional substance that the gangs carried to Kingston's poor. In 1980, a pivotal national election in Jamaica was a culmination of the political unrest that had shaken the foundations of its government. The radical divisions between Michael Manley and Edward Sega led to disaster. The 1980 election in Jamaica was a bloodbath in which perhaps as many as a thousand people lost their lives. The level of terror in 1980 was unlike anything Jamaicans had ever experienced before. Anybody who had a grudge to settle in Kingston or anywhere else in the island hoped to get themselves recruited. Most of the gunmen wanted to fire shots for the Jamaica Labor Party because it was already well known by that time that the Jamaica Labor Party was the one favored by the United States and the CIA. As expected, Edward Seeger and the Jamaican Labor Party were swept into power, a power that extended to one of his strongest supporters, Jim Brown. With Seeger's victory, Brown emerged not only as his bodyguard, but as a leader in Tivoli Garden. So that when the election was over, what you had was victorious gunmen, of whom Jim Brown was the most important. He emerged at the top of the heap after 1980, and losing gunmen on the PNP side, who got the message very quickly that they had better get out of the island if they wanted to live. So that was really, it was the 1980 election in Jamaica that initiated the exodus of the posses to, to the United States. Because once that election was over, there was only room in Jamaica for a few of the victorious posse dons. It was only the ones at the very top of the heap who were very closest to Siaga, who were going to really be able to parlay the work they had done for Siaga in the 1980 election into continuing a lucrative life. Though Jim Brown, as Don of Tivoli Gardens, was already earning a reputation as a man to be feared, he was still considered a hero to his followers. To them, he was living the Hollywood screen legend of the American West, the lone, misunderstood gunman, achieving good against all odds. He was a person who decided to stand up for the cause of the community. He put himself forward, he sacrificed himself for that, for we, you know, the community. The Don would be synonymous with that of a godfather. The Don, the Don basically is the leader within the community. He provides the protection and he tends to be um, a major figure. A champion, yes. Champion, because he's a champion for the people. For the people in West Kingston. He respect the people and the people him being the same amount of respect. I will love that, you know. As much as law enforcement will look at the Dons as being criminals, within the community, the Dons are seen as leaders, as community activists, as people who provide the community with certain basic necessities. So I think you have an interesting 
contradiction there as to who is looking at the Dan and who is interpreting um, what the Dan is doing and whether the Dan is benefiting the community or is in fact being detrimental to the community. A good man, but if, if, if it comes to the test, you know, a good man can turn. Several things happened to Jim Brown after the 1980 election. One of them was that as Siaga's bodyguard, he had what was basically diplomatic immunity. He could shovel back and forth with Siaga or on his own between Jamaica and the United States. The other thing was that after 1980, Ronald Reagan was in the White House, and America really stepped up its war on drugs abroad. In the case of Jamaica, what this meant was American military and USAID funding for ganja, marijuana, eradication in Jamaica. And it became increasingly difficult for Jamaicans to get their product off the island. So men like Jim Brown, who had contacts with politicians, who had contacts on the wharves in West Kingston, which are within the area that Siaga controls, became crucially important to Jamaica's growers because they could no longer attempt to get their drugs off the island. What, what Jim Brown did was to basically leapfrog the Jamaican marijuana connection into the United States using his connections in Miami, Toronto, Washington, D.C., New York, and Los Angeles and keep the money flowing in to Jamaica's growers for whom marijuana was the only game in town. It was Jamaica's only cash crop. This was a real story of Jim Brown and his criminal organization called the Shower Posse. With a shower of ammunition posse members would unleash against rivals. They began as brutal enforcers of political will. They would soon be ruled by an even greater force, a worldwide demand for illegal drugs. The Shower Posse entered the U.S. narcotics trade at a critical time. Usage was at an all-time high, and the drug war in the United States, though heavily funded and widely promoted, continued to be ineffective. The Shower Posse, by any other name, had really resolved itself into an entity by the time of the 1980 election. Jim Brown was already at the helm as Siaga's bodyguard. He was the top-ranking enforcer in Kingston. But it really wasn't until after the election when all of these gangsters on both sides, all of what Jamaicans call the friars, the small chickens, were basically skittering out of Jamaica to try to make their fortunes in the United States, that Jim Brown saw that the real money lay up here in the burgeoning crack cocaine trade. Jim Brown, along with his second-in-command, Vivian Blake, already had connections in New York, Washington, and Miami to make the Shower Posse an important force in the sale of crack cocaine. Jamaican sort of storefront operations sold marijuana, reggae records, vegetarian food. Vivian Blake and Jim Brown saw that they could parlay these connections in Jamaican communities across the country into very lucrative crack cocaine trade. At the same time, they also had their own Jamaican product, marijuana, that they could sell. And what basically happened by the time crack hit the streets in the United States was that the drug lords, the Colombians, um, particularly the Cali cartel, which had a special relationship with the shower posse. It's been said that the Cali cartel handpicked Jim Brown and the shower to be its street-level middlemen in the United States. The Colombian cartels, in a lot of cases, in certain cities, have better market penetration than Burger King. It's, uh, uh, the st if, you, if you don't believe me, ask any cop. Ask the next cop you see. He will tell you that he can find drugs or drug users or drug dealers probably within a few blocks of where you're, where you're standing right at that very moment. They were bolder than the rest. They had come from an island, it must be remembered, in which the police force routinely commits between one-third and one-half of the island's homicides. That's a staggering total when you think about it. So these were gangsters who were perfectly willing to violate the most important rule that the underworld has ever known, which is don't kill cops. Jamaicans do not abide by that rule. They were perfectly willing to kill police officers, and they were perfectly willing to shoot anybody who was in the way. 
they thrived on violence and they were quite willing to use it and this made them ideal street level enforcers. Jim Brown and the Shower Posse were thriving. In Jamaica, he was at the height of his power. When the neighboring community of Rima posed a threat, it was Brown who led a reprisal raid in which 12 people were murdered. Though there was a public outcry, he was never brought to justice. Instead, the government seemed to expand his ability to move freely to and from Jamaica. For Brown, business was good. Crack cocaine usage had grown to epidemic proportions in the United States. Law enforcement so far was ineffective. The body count attributed to shower posse violence continued to rise. According to the United Nations, we're, uh, the drug market internationally is somewhere around $400 billion a year, which puts it ahead of the oil business and slightly behind the arms trade as number two in the top three industries on the planet today. That money is going tax-free into the hands of some of the worst people on the planet. And they are using that money to strengthen themselves. The United States authorities had no idea who Jim Brown was. He was shuttling back and forth between Kingston and Miami. And as soon, almost as soon as he got here, got to Miami in 1984, he perpetrated a multiple homicide in a crack house in Miami in which five people, one of them a pregnant woman who knelt and prayed for her life while he executed her, um, five people were killed. And speaking of dominance, this is, this is a way you do it. This is a way you get your name known on the street in the drug trade is by being willing to perpetrate these kinds of homicides. It was only after the 1984 crack house slayings in Miami that federal law enforcement authorities and the Metro Dade police in, in Miami realized that Jim Brown and Lester Lloyd Coke were the same person. March 30th, 1985. Shower Posse members opened fire on 300 reggae dancers at the Firemen's Benevolent Association Ball in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. One man is killed, three others injured. The body count from posse violence continues to rise. The thing that really snafued the posses in the United States and brought alcohol, tobacco, and firearms into the prosecution of them was their penchant for interstate firearms trafficking. They became very good at buying guns in Ohio, Virginia, and West Virginia. Those were their three favorite states. And Carrying them up by car to New York, Boston, wherever guns were needed for posse operations. At that point, Jim Brown was also sending firearms back to Jamaica. In 1984, the shower did send down to Jamaica an enormous shipment of firearms that wound up on the Kingston wharves, and someone was tipped off, and so the person who was to claim it never did. When they opened the barrel and found these high-powered weapons, this was the first time that Interpol, the international police organization, was called in to try to track the source of these guns. And it was discovered that some of these same guns that had been sent in this barrel back to Jamaica had been used in homicides in the United States. And it was really that shipment of guns to Jamaica in 1984 that first alerted international law enforcement to the presence of the posses. July 3rd, 1985. Posse violence strikes down an innocent child. A six-year-old Miami girl on her way to buy an ice cream cone is killed in a gunfight between rival posses. The, uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms was really the first federal agency to realize what the posses were or even that there were posses because law enforcement on the state level began to turn up homicides and, and firearms trafficking 
and it was when they began to see all of this gun trading going on that they turned to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms because that's really ATF's purview. Law enforcement, now aware of the growing threat, began a unique effort to eradicate Brown and the Shower Posse. You know, there's always been a tremendous rivalry in this country between municipal police departments and federal agencies, between the police and the FBI, the FBI and the ATF, and then, of course, the Drug Enforcement Agency, which is relatively new. In the case of the Posse's, for most of these successful prosecutions, they put their rivalry on the back burner, and that's what enabled them to win. You know, ATF says, I don't want DEA getting in my hair, and DEA says, you know, I don't want ATF on my territory. And in the case of these gangs, in order to successfully prosecute them, the interagency rivalries went by the board. I think the most, the most exciting and interesting thing about busting the posses as far as American law enforcement was concerned was that as an ATF agent in New York told me, these guys were really bad and we knew that if we wanted to take them out, we were going to have to drop our rivalry. Everybody started basically to become aware at the same time. Interpol realized that the posses were shipping firearms to Jamaica. They called in ATF's help. Um, various state and municipal law enforcement realized that there, were, there was this Jamaican presence that was very violent, that had a great deal of firepower that they had never seen before. So it really all began to happen 84, 85. That was really when the United States authorities awoke to the presence of the posses. The New York office of the FBI began to research the need for and the possibility of creating a squad dedicated to targeting Jamaican criminal organizations. The research found that uh, from the late 70s uh, into the 80s and throughout the 80s, the Jamaican organized criminal groups were becoming more and more of a presence, um, both here in New York and, uh, and across the country. And the Shower Posse was one of the largest posses ever to, to dominate the New York criminal landscape. The Shower was really, I think, the only posse of its day that deserved to be called Jamaican organized crime. At the very top was Jim Brown and his right-hand man, Vivian Blake, who, legend has it, had a scholarship to play soccer at Columbia University and left to sell drugs. Vivian Blake was educated. He was polished. He was the son of a man who had been in the People's National Party with Norman Washington Manley in the 30s and 40s. Jim Brown was sort of a ghetto ruffian, if you will, and Vivian Blake had the charm and the connections uptown. They were the real leaders. The shower had various trusted henchmen all over the United States, but they all did report to Jim Brown and Vivian Blake, and it was a much more centralized organization. It was probably really the only posse that you could give the name of organized crime to. Um, I have heard it said that organized, that Jamaican organized crime is an oxymoron, that it should better be called Jamaican disorganized crime, because the truth of the matter was, as any federal agent will tell you, that Jamaicans never had the kind of omerta bond of loyalty that the Mafia did. When American law enforcement was able to arrest a few of the posse members in various states and various locales, they found that these men were often so frightened and so willing to cooperate in return for lighter sentences that it was much easier to break apart these gangs. Once you roped in one or two of its troops or its workers, they would sing operas for law enforcement about the operation. The Jamaican Posse didn't have a, a strict code of silence among its members. Uh, what it did was to make up for that was practice an extreme level of violence and intimidation. And simply not out of honor did people not talk, but out of fear they did not talk. And I think they made up for a long history 
of not talking about the activities as some of these traditional groups did they in, in a very short time established a similar uh, code uh, uh, through fear and through, through the extreme level of violence and I think that uh, in, in part that was a conscious effort to to establish that kind of code in a short period of time and they did that through acts of extreme want and violence perhaps the most violent of all the shower posse members was its own leader Jim Brown and he was someone who was feared um, and, and feared because of the violence that both he could bring and the people around him could bring he surrounded himself with violent people uh, extremely violent people but there is a gun culture in Jamaican society that there is a fascination for guns and of course one of the things about guns is that when you put guns in the hands of poor people or suffer youths it is a form of empowerment you know it gives them a sense that they can they have control over life and death and so one of the things that has emerged in the society when you examine the, um, the poor communities is that there has been a proliferation of guns. Other posse members, I have interviewed uh, and spoken with numerous other members of other posses who at times dealt with shower posse members including Jim Brown and uh, it was always a uh, somewhat intimidating experience even for some of these people who were fairly violent money themselves. You, I pay you good money. I take care of you. You know that. I put food on your table and, and they um, always knew when they were going into some kind of transaction with him and personally or with his people around him that they had to be very careful because of the, his reputation that, that preceded him. Well, there's a man, if you mash him can, I'm going to mash back your can, you see me? And when I mash your can, the whole, the whole of the can feel like a mash. Can't tell you that. While Vivian Blake ran the Shower Posse's U.S. activities, Brown controlled operations in Kingston. To his followers, he was larger than life, a Robin Hood who used criminal proceeds to fund community centers, to pay for local children's school tuition, and even to pay for burial suits. What you can say about Jim Brown was that if you were a supporter, you adored him, and if you were an adversary, you were terrified of him. He was obviously ruthless. It will never be known how many people he killed, certainly well upwards of 20, if you just count the homicides in Jamaica alone. Men, women, children, law enforcement. It seemed that the shower posse's violence had no limits and that no one could stop Jim Brown. And Jim Brown was arrested in 1984 after the homicides in Miami, and he was deported by the Immigration and Naturalization Service back to Jamaica where he was promptly set free because as Siaga's right-hand man and one of his principal enforcers he was what Jamaicans call an untouchable meaning that the law would never lay its hand upon him so he proceeded to keep shuttling back and forth from Jamaica to the United States after 1984 on various passports and various aliases until 1986 when he murdered a minibus driver in Jamaica and this was the first and only case that ever brought him before the law by that time the posses had become so violent in Jamaica and in the United States that there was there had begun to be an outcry against the untouchables and Jim Brown was brought to trial but the predictable took place he was tried and acquitted and on the day that he was acquitted, uh, his shower posse supporters mobbed the street in front of the Jamaican Supreme Court and bust shot, shot off their guns to show their joy at the verdict. Law enforcement kept its sights on Jim Brown. The RICO, a racketeer influence and corrupt organization statute, allowed federal officials to pursue the leadership of the shower posse for the crimes of its soldiers. Jim Brown's days, it seemed, were numbered. American law enforcement was beginning to feel they'd go up against these gangs and win. There had been so, there had been so many homicides by that time attributed to Jim Brown and the shower that uh, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, the DEA, the FBI, 
the New York Police Department and the Metro Dade Police Department felt that if they could get Jim Brown back to the United States, they could prosecute him and win. Continuing pressure from the United States and ongoing violence on the streets of Kingston finally forced the Jamaican government to take Brown into custody. An extradition process was initiated to send him back to the United States to face justice as the assault on the Shower Posse and other Jamaican gangs continued. The Shower Posse may have been a victim of its own success. Uh, it got, it, was, it had grown to be a very large posse. The Shower Posse became very large. With the advent of crack cocaine coming on the scene, it created huge amounts of cash for these groups, a high pro profit margin, and the cash resulted in uh, internal feuds. Uh, more people wanted more of the cash. The uh, posses at that time had a, a very vertical organizational structure where the people at the top are the people that benefited the most, and the people in the middle and at the lower ends didn't benefit too much. And with the advent of this huge inflow of cash from the sale of crack cocaine, it created a lot of problems within uh, the posses and the shower posse. A large posse like that and internal strife kind of came into play and splinter groups started um, to form and uh, members started to relocate to other areas where they thought they could establish their own crack cocaine business. U.S. authorities continue their assault on Jamaican posses Robert Chacon recalls one important raid. December 6, 1990, a, a coordinated effort um, led by the New York Office of the FBI in conjunction with the New York City Police Department, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, the State Department, uh, the Immigration Service, uh, and numerous other state and local and federal agencies. Uh, executed uh, simultaneously 32 search warrants, mainly in Brooklyn, New York, but also in Albany, New York, Long Island, New York, and Dallas, Texas. Uh, the search warrants targeted numerous locations known to be used by the posse, used as re either residences or uh, warehouses for cash and guns and drugs. Uh, numerous posse members were arrested that night, taken into federal custody. Uh, automatic weapons were seized, large amounts of marijuana, cocaine and heroin were also seized that night. The message was clear. The crime and violence of the Shower Posse and other Jamaican gangs would be met with a full force of American law enforcement. Jim Brown, meanwhile, wasn't giving in so easily. He fought them uh, all the way up to the British Privy Council, which is the court of last resort for Jamaica and he appealed the extradition to the British Privy Council, which ultimately, in 1992, denied his appeal, which meant that he was, that Jim Brown was going to be extradited to stand trial in the United States. In February 1992, U.S. Federal Marshals arrived at Kingston's General Penitentiary to take Jim Brown back to the United States. But before they could take custody, Brown was burned to death in a fire in his cell. Though there is no hard evidence, some believe they know why Jim Brown was killed. Edward Siaga knew that if he were allowed to go back to the United States and talk, he would tell the federal authorities everything he knew about his connections to Siaga and the Jamaica Labor Party and the ways in which the party had aided and abetted the Shower Posse's exploits in the United States. Whatever the cause, the fire in Kingston brought to a close Jim Brown's life, but not his puzzling legacy. At Jim Brown's memorial, former Prime Minister Edward Seeger would call Brown the protector of Kingston's poor. Thousands of mourners attended what seemed like a state funeral. The 
question is often asked, why if these men are so violent? Why if they kill so many in their own neighborhoods in the line of duty? Why are they seen as heroes? Why are they seen as Robin Hoods to the fore? And the reason is really very simple. It's that throughout the 1980s, as the International Monetary Fund cracked down on debt-ridden third world countries like Jamaica, and as the New World Economic Order increasingly marginalized countries like Jamaica. The drug trade became the only game in town. These men, men like Jim Brown and uh, his shower posse, became the people, the only people, who were putting shoes on the feet of children, who were putting roofs over people's heads, who when Hurricane Gilbert hit Jamaica in the fall of 1988, and the government was so corrupt that it never dispensed any of the foreign aid and the rebuilding materials that, that various countries provided. It was the posses who had the foreign capital, who had the hard cash, and to basically resuscitate entire communities. So that when somebody needs money to pay a child's school entrance fee, they're going to turn to their local posse. That's who they're going to go to for help because they can't go to the government anymore. These governments have been so crippled by the International Monetary Fund that they have nothing to dispense. So basically what you're seeing, and you're seeing it all over the world, you're seeing it in Mexico, you're seeing it in Colombia, you're seeing it in Jamaica, and all the islands throughout the Caribbean, is a withering away of the power of the state. You're seeing states that are now so impotent, so unable to really provide for their own people that the drug trade steps in to fill the vacuum. And that is why these men, despite their violence and their mayhem, are seen as Robin Hood heroes to the poor. The thing that plagues Jamaican society, and it is something that the society has to resolve in the coming decades, is how do you distribute, distribute wealth much more evenly, uh, much more symmetrically? A democratic society as Jamaica cannot really maintain social order effectively or non-coercively unless it can find a way to include um, its marginalized elements, its unemployed, its very poor into the benefits of the society. And that's a challenge that confronts the society in the coming decades. Law enforcement can't reform society. It is a holding action. It is a, it's a temporary barricade against uh, the worst proclivities of a society. What we need to do uh, in the United States and elsewhere is to find ways to convince the public to shy away from those activities which support organized crime, of which organized crime is, feeds itself. You, you'll never eliminate crime from society. But what you can do is that if you reduce the level of marginalization, you will invariably reduce the level of violence in a society. Any society, if it wants to reduce the level of violence, if it wants to achieve a state of wholesomeness, wholesomeness if it wants to increase um, to a high level of civility, it has got to find ways in which young people can be channeled in such a way that they can become productive human beings. If you, if you block those channels, then you set up a system in which um, people are reproduced as gunmen, as, um, as hustlers, as um, people with an irreverence for human life. U.S. authorities attributed over 1,400 murders to Jim Brown and the Jamaican Shower Posse in the few short years they thrived. Both the explosive world of the drug culture and the unprecedented efforts of law enforcement effectively dismantled this dangerous new threat. As long as the demand for illicit drugs continues, however, posses and other drug gangs will always exist to serve the customer. For law enforcement, the fight continues. I'm Robert Stack. Thanks for joining.